ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. <coughs> Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at a big skin mystery. You OK, Chris? Yep, I'm just helping my body to get rid of a few thousand dead skin cells. Uh, OK. As I scratch my skin, the top layer is flaking off into the air. Yes, I can see that, Chris, but why? Your body already does that all by itself to make way for new skin cells. In fact, as it grows, skin sheds 50,000 dead cells every single minute, totally replenishing itself every four weeks. Yes, I know, Zahn. I know all your skin facts. I told you most of them. OK, well, why are you flaking off your skin, then? Because, Zahn, I am trying to solve, once and for all, a question that has puzzled humankind throughout the ages. Since ancient times, we have searched, nay, quested... Yes, that's right, right, Chris. Throughout history, legions of scientists have been desperate to answer this one burning question. What is the question? Why does the skin on our fingers and toes go wrinkly in the bath? Yes, I have always wondered about that. Exactly. The answer just has to be out there somewhere. Well, I have heard tell of a new scientific theory in which you may be interested. This, Chris, could hold the key that unlocks the ring. Really? And it's all to do with this. Now, take hold of that. Ugh. There has been a big new research study into this skin mystery, and their results suggested that our fingers and toes get wrinkly to help you grip wet things, like the grooves on this tyre. The wrinkles in wet skin create little channels for the water to escape, giving you more grip on a wet surface. Well, I don't believe it. I didn't say put the tyre down. I think the only thing for us to do is put it to the test like proper scientists. Can I put it down now? No. There we go. Sand, what are you doing? Well, I'm getting ready to test the why do our fingers go wrinkly in the bath theory, obviously. Right, we don't actually need to have a bath to do that, though. If you'd bothered to read this research carefully, then you'd see we simply need to replicate the real experiment that the other scientists use here. Right? Obviously. I'm not convinced myself, but let's put this wrinkly finger theory to the test. Are you ready, Zand? I'm ready. Go! Using just our thumbs and forefingers, we're moving wet objects from one bowl to another through the screen. First, we're timing how long it takes us with smooth, non-wrinkly fingers. I know it's not a race, but I really want to beat you, Chris. Yes! No! Oh! So, my time for smooth, non-wrinkly fingers was 32 seconds. And mine was 35 seconds. Now, we'll repeat exactly the same experiment, but with wrinkly fingers. So, we need to soak them like when you've had a bath. I'm thinking I might just use a bowl of warm water to pop our fingers in. Now, Zand... Zand? Zand! What are you doing? I'm having a bath. You said we needed our fingers to be wrinkly, like in the bath. Right, but we only need to soak our hands in a bowl of warm water, not our whole bodies. Well, now that I'm in, it seems like a shame not to have a soak. So our hands are having some quality, warm water time, ensuring our fingers are really wrinkly for the next part of the experiment. After 10 minutes, things are looking super shriveled. Let's put those pinkies through their paces. Three, two, one, go! If the new theory is right, our wrinkly fingers will be better at gripping, and so we'll do the experiment quicker than before. Done! Oh. Well, Zahn, it may have been a dead heat, but how did our non-wrinkly fingers compare to our wrinkly fingers? Well, I can reveal that we both had the same wrinkly finger time, which was 41 seconds, slower than before. Which means the answer to the mystery of why your fingers go wrinkly in the bath is... still a mystery. And talking of baths, I think my fingers need just a little more bath time. Chris! <laughs> As part of today's special show, we're looking at hormones. Just don't try anything you see here at home. It's Chris. Can I have a biscuit? I don't want one of your disgusting pocket digestives. OK, fair enough. 
like a custard cream. Well, I don't know where he keeps his custard creams. He hides them from me. They're on the desk in front of you. Oh, yeah, here they are. I've counted them. Can you write them down in the custard cream logbook so I can keep track? Chris, why are you sending me all these ridiculous text messages? I'm trying to work. Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Zant. It's not just because I want those custard creams, although I do want them. You've written them in the logbook now. It's because today's lab is all about hormones, and like text, hormones are messages, but they're chemical ones sent around your body. You can't control them any more than Zant could control the number of texts I was sending him. You have hormones from the moment you're born telling the different cells in your body what to do. Your pancreas makes the hormone insulin to control sugar levels in your blood. And your adrenal glands produce the hormone adrenaline when you're excited or scared, preparing your body for immediate action. And then there's your pituitary gland in your brain. And to show you what that looks like, I've actually got a real sheep's brain in my hand. Now, the first thing you'll notice is it's much smaller than a human brain. And that's probably why sheep are less intelligent than human beings. Chris, there might be sheep watching. It doesn't matter, they're sheep. They won't understand what I just said. All right, well, I've cut it in half so you can see right here at the base of the brain is the pituitary gland. Now, take a look at this MRI scan of my actual brain. And there's my pituitary gland right there. Now, it may be small, but it has a big job to do because it's the pituitary gland that controls most of the hormones in your body. But when you reach puberty, your hormones go into supercharge mode. They spring into action like never before, and they're responsible for all the changes that take place during puberty. And one of these changes occurs in the voice box, the organ which allows you to speak. And we're going to show you what it looks like. Now, with this is the larynx, or the voice box, of a young pig. Your voice box is in your throat. It's the tough, rubbery bit here on your neck. Now, I also have a pig's larynx, except that mine is bigger than Chris's, and that's because it's from an adult pig. Now, one of these two larynxes will have a deeper sound than the other, but which one do you think it's going to be? The bellows are acting like your lungs, sending air past the vocal cords, which you can see here. And they make a sound when they vibrate. Compare the sound of this smaller larynx to the sound of the larger one. Can you hear the sound of the larger one is deeper than the smaller one? This change in sound is known as your voice breaking, and it happens to both boys and girls. Now, when you go through puberty, those hormones controlled by your pituitary gland tell your larynx to grow bigger, and that makes your voice get deeper. So, we've shown you that hormones are messages telling your body what to do. When you start puberty, your hormones become more active, telling you to grow into an adult. And remember, hormones are what make your voice break, only nothing's breaking at all. Your larynx actually gets bigger, and that makes your voice deeper. But whether you're a boy or a girl, don't panic, because it doesn't hurt at all. It's all completely normal. It's definitely more obvious for us boys, because our larynxes grow more than girls, and so it pushes this bit out. It's called your Adam's apple. Ow, why don't you poke your own Adam's apple? It's more fun poking yours. Stop it, it's really annoying. Really annoying, like sending somebody loads of text messages. Stop poking my Adam's apple. How do you do that? Ouch. Ready to see some amazing experiments? This is the Operation Arch Poo Factory. We show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're taking you on a journey down your body's information superhighway. We're talking about your nerves. Come and have a look at this. Now, where in the body do you think you'd find this lot? Is it A, inside your stomach, B, inside your leg, or C, inside your back? Well, the answer is C. It's inside your back. This is a spinal column, and it runs all the way from the bottom of your head to the top of your bottom. Now, this spinal column is from a pig, but yours is very similar. The whole structure is designed to protect a very important bunch of nerves called the spinal cord, and it runs down this groove in the middle. And this is the spinal cord itself. The reason 
that it's so well protected inside those bones is because it's very important. It carries all the information from your brain to your muscles. And what's really amazing is some nerves carry signals at 100 meters per second, which is 10 times faster than anyone can run, even Usain Bolt. So how are they so fast? Well, we're going to show you. Hang on, that's the lunch bell. Woohoo! <laughs> Just a minute, Sand. It's not lunchtime yet. What's everyone doing in the canteen? Uh, Zand, what on earth is going on? It's actually part of a plan to show you how nerves work. Now, the lunch queue represents one single nerve. All the way along the nerve are iron channels. And that's what the people in this lunch queue are. They pass the message from one place to another all along the length of the nerve. OK, I see. So I represent my own brain, and I'm thirsty and I want a cup of tea, but in order to get my hand to get me a cup of tea, I have to send a message down this line, just like the brain would send a nerve signal down a nerve. So my brain is using the iron channels in my nerve to send a message to my hand for a drink. Mm, tea. OK. Uh, milk, two sugars, please. Thank you. Ooh, this tea is very hot. I'd better send a note to Chris's brain, see what he wants me to do about it. Hurry up, Iron Channels. This is really hot. Ah! Tea is too hot. Hmm. Well, Zahn's message did eventually get to me, but it took a long time, didn't it? Well, from my perspective, the tea is too hot to drink, so I'm going to go back to the lab. Come on, Iron Channels. Uh, Chris? Chris? Thankfully, your nerves have a trick up their sleeves to make them work a whole lot better than our lunch queue. And we're going to show you just what that is by using dominoes. Dominoes? Great! Now, each line of dominoes represents a single nerve. And each domino is an iron channel, just like those people in the lunch queue. Now, in this lineup, all the dominoes are side by side. But in this lineup, there are rulers between each domino. And these rulers represent something called a myelin sheath. Now, in your body, there is a myelin sheath wrapped around many of your nerves. This is what allows messages to travel down your nerves in a very special way. Both cars will go round the loop, but... Which car is going to jump first? Let's find out. It's time for a nerve race. Wearing blue in lane one, it's the rampaging ruler, the myelin sheath mover, Dr Chris! And in lane two, the green machine, the domino dominator, Dr. Zahn. Drivers at the ready. Three, two, one, go! Yes! Let's see that again. What a start from Dr. Chris's myelin sheath as it streaks ahead of Dr. Zahn's dawdling dominoes. Exactly what happens inside your body as the myelin sheath wrapped around the nerve allows the signal to go super fast and sends the blue car speeding to the finish. It's just as well, because if your nerves were like Zahn's race, you'd be the slowest moving human on the planet. Oi! So, we've shown you the amazing superhighway of nerves that is your spinal cord. And we've shown you how they pass messages around your body so quickly at 100 metres per second. And that's all thanks to a layer of fat called the myelin sheath, which allows messages to jump along the nerve, getting to their destination super fast. Right, I want to have a rematch. Fine, we can. But you have to set up the dominoes. Well, no problem at all. OK, good. Now, this time, I'm going to want the other line-up. I wonder if I can get rid of some of these blue dominoes. Oh! Ready to see one of our all-time favourite experiments? Yes! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. <coughs> now, today, we're going to be looking at what happens <coughs> when you cough. Now, a cough is a reflex action that your body does to get rid of something harmful or irritating which you've breathed in by mistake, like icing sugar, for example. Icing sugar? Why would I breathe in icing sugar? We're in a lab, not a kitchen. And when I do bake, I always make savoury things like, you know, the cheese twists with... <coughs> Water! <coughs> now we're going to show you Chris coughing like you've never seen it before. Now this is a video of 
the inside of my head. This was taken using a magnetic resonance imaging machine, or MRI. Now, the main difference between a cough and simply breathing out hard is my favourite body part, your epiglottis. Its normal job is to stop food going into your lungs when you swallow, but in a cough, it closes off the lungs and allows pressure to build up in the lungs. Sand, do the first part of a cough. Now, Sand's closed his epiglottis, the pressure's rising in his chest, so when he opens it, <coughs> the air rushes out at 60 miles an hour. But if a cough's that powerful, where does it go? And what's in it? Well, we're gonna show you. It's time for competitive <coughs> coughing. What is going on? Well, I've made these cutouts that look just like you and me. They don't look anything like me. They're all blue. I'm the green twit. Everything I wear is green. It's greenish. It's... it's... does that look the same? It's turquoise! Doesn't look anything alike! It's not relevant, Sand. The point is, I've put plates full of a special scientific gunk called agar jelly on the faces of our cutouts. So if any bacteria happen to land on any of our plates, they're going to multiply so much we can actually see them. OK, Chris, you ready? Three, two, one, cough! We're doing two experiments, one where the plates are 10 centimetres away and another where they're 50 centimetres away. <coughs> well, all done. Not quite, Chris. I want you to take this agar plate and hold it in front of your face and I'm going to cough on it. And this time, I'm going to cover my mouth with my elbow the way you're supposed to and hopefully no germs should land on the plate. OK, we'll just make sure you do it properly. <coughs> <coughs> And now, we have to wait. In lab conditions, bacteria take some time to grow. Luckily, we came prepared for a long wait. And finally, the test results are in. So let's check out the cutouts that were 50 centimetres away first. Oh, yuck! This has worked really well. All these bacteria have grown into thick, furry, yucky blooms. Ugh. Well, let's have a look at mine. Ugh! They're even worse than Zant's. Mine are also growing in horrible, slimy, furry, green colonies. And all this from just one cough. Now for the cutouts that were only 10 centimetres away. Oh! This is even worse! There's loads of furry stuff in here. Oh, that is disgusting. Let's have a look at mine. Ugh! There's a huge bacterial splat in the middle of the plate. I must have coughed off a lot of saliva with that one. So this is like coughing into someone's face when they're right next to you. And that's bad news for them when you realise that the average cough has 20,000 viruses in it. Which brings me to our last result. Let's have a look at the plate where I covered my mouth and coughed at Chris. Oh, two bacteria! I knew you hadn't covered your mouth properly. I think you can see, though, that this is a lot better than the other ones we did. So, there you have it. In case you were in any doubt about whether or not to cover your mouth when you cough, we've shown that not only could your cough reach the person right next to you, but it could travel a lot further than that. Yuck. And as well as seeing how far they travel, we've shown you just how much bacteria there can be in coughs. Well, there's a lot more in yours than in mine, Chris. You should see a doctor. Maybe I should. Better go find one. Ready to see some amazing experiments? This is the Operation Ouch Poo Factory. We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Chris, can I trouble you for a favour? I need to borrow something of yours for an experiment. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Hang on, trouble me for what? Some of your blood? You've got eight pints of it. Absolutely not. I'm using mine at the moment. Yeah, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to get it on telly. Ooh, this does sound good, actually. Great. Now, remember, we can only do this because we're doctors. Now, you might think I'm being brave with this needle, but you've got to remember that needles don't hurt unless you think they hurt, and I don't think it hurts. Nice work, Zand. I have to say, though, for all the vital jobs it does, like carrying oxygen around my body, it's not much to look at, is it? I mean, it's just sort of red and gloopy, right? 
Wrong! It is much to look at, but only if you put it in one of these. This is a centrifuge machine. This is my centrifuge machine. I've been looking for that. Stop interrupting. We're trying to do an experiment. By spinning Chris's blood around at high speed, the centrifuge machine will separate the different parts that make up blood so we can see them. And ten minutes later... So there we go. Now, this top liquid layer is called the plasma, and it carries nutrients around your body and also carries waste material that your body wants to get rid of. And underneath the plasma, you can see this red layer, and that is made up of red blood cells or erythrocytes. And these carry oxygen all around your body. And also in there are the platelets, and those are the cells that help you form blood clots. And right between these two layers, you can see a little bit of cloudiness. Those are white blood cells to fight infection. Well, there we go, Chris. We're all done with that now. Why are you giving me this? I only needed to borrow it. I'm a man of my word. So you've seen what your blood is made up of. But do you know where your blood comes from? Well, we're going to show you. Gross alert coming up. Amazingly, your blood comes from your bones. If you thought your bones were just solid, hard, white things that kept you standing up, then think again, because there's more to bones than that. Now, to demonstrate this, I've got a pig's femur. That's the big bone that you've got in your thigh. And we're going to open this one up to see how bones make blood. The femur is one of the strongest bones in the body, so we're going to need some very specialist kit to cut it open. Exactly. Right, Zand. Or we could use a medical femur saw. It's the only thing that doctors ever, ever use to cut bones. OK, we'll do it your way. It's time to saw open some bone. Chris the saw. Get ready, because this is going to be a bit messy. This is the inside of a pig's femur. And right here, this squishy stuff is red bone marrow. Now, it's the red bone marrow that makes all your blood cells. In fact, every single day, your bone marrow makes 500 billion blood cells. Busy. Now, the inside of your bones looks like this. It's pink with a lot of red marrow. But as you get older, your marrow starts to turn yellow. Chris, the yellow bone marrow coming right up. This is the inside of an adult cow's leg bone. This yellow bone marrow is a much lighter colour. It's very soft and squidgy, and that's because it's mostly fat cells. And this is what your mum and dad's bone marrow looks like. And that's because your body needs more blood when it's growing a lot. But as you get older and you don't have so much growing to do, some of the red marrow, which makes blood, turns to yellow marrow, which is basically a fat store. So you have more red marrow than a grown-up. But how does blood get from inside the bones to flowing around your body? Well, we're going to show you. Come and have a good look at this. Right there, between that bit of bone marrow and the hard bit of bone, is a blood vessel. So that's coming right inside your bones to pick up all that nice new blood being made by the marrow every single day. How cool is that? So we've shown you that inside, your bones are amazing blood-making factories and veins come right inside the bones to pick up that blood. And we've seen that blood is made up of different things, all of which have different jobs in your body. You know, Chris, I did have a sense that that chainsaw was a bit over the top. Did you, Zand? I could feel it in my bones. Ouch! Ready to see some amazing stuff? Yes! We're going to show you where you began. Just don't try anything you see here at home. In this lab, you'll see a very special human organ, but it's not for the squeamish. Today, we're looking at how babies grow. Right, here you go, Chris. You can get a nice close look at my belly button with that. Whoa, I think I've missed something. Why on earth would I or anyone want to look at your belly button? Well, I thought we were looking at how babies grow. Yes, but what's that got to do with your... Ah, oh, hold on. I see where you're going with this. Exactly. Because did you know that your belly button used to be your mouth and your bum? OK, yes, that's true. But we still don't need to look at your belly buttons, on because I've got something much more impressive. Take a look at this. Whoa! 
That is much more impressive than my belly button because this is a real human placenta and umbilical cord. These amazing organs are what keep a baby alive and able to grow inside its mum. The placenta's job is to absorb oxygen and vital nutrients from the mum's blood and deliver them to the baby via the umbilical cord. As well as this, the umbilical cord also carries waste products, that's wee poo and carbon dioxide, away from the baby, down the umbilical cord and through the placenta into mum's body for her to get rid of. Now, once you're born, you don't need these anymore, which is why we have these to show you. They've been kindly donated to us by a mum who's given birth to her baby, and she's happy for us to show them to you, which is pretty special. This placenta is absolutely amazing. But, you know, I've always said that there's really only one thing better than a real human placenta, and that is a double human placenta from twins. Wow! This must have been what our placenta looked like when we were inside our mum. Absolutely. This has also kindly been donated by the mum of twins. So what you can see here is two placentas and two umbilical cords. After you're born, the cord gets snipped off, leaving you with your belly button. But until then, this cord is your lifeline. But what does a baby look like when it's actually inside its mum? We're going to show you. Now, what we've got here is a real live baby. Zon, this isn't a baby, this is Amelia, and she's a grown-up. That's true. Thanks very much for coming into the lab, Amelia. Thanks, but Amelia. But actually, inside Amelia is a real-life baby. Uh -huh. And ordinarily, of course, we couldn't show you that baby, but we have this ultrasound scanner. So, Amelia, are you having a boy or a girl? A boy. A boy. Amelia, how many weeks pregnant are you? 29 weeks. At this stage, a baby's organs are developed. Just here, what you can see beating is Amelia's baby's heart. Wow, amazing! The white things here are his bones, so that's his backbone. Very clearly, you can see that there. Surrounding the baby, these big black patches are liquid. And that's because the baby's sitting in a thing called the amniotic sac. So it's sitting in a big sac full of fluid. That protects it from bumps and from infections. At the moment, his eyes have started to work, his heart and all his organs are working normally. The one massive difference between being inside Amelia and being out in the world is that this little boy is breathing entirely through his umbilical cord, through his belly button. But what we really want to know is what does he look like? So we've been able to do a 4D scan. 4D scans provide an incredible lifelike image of the baby inside the womb. You can see his eyes, his nose and his little mouth. Amelia, what do you think? It's amazing. He looks like his dad, but with my nose. <sighs> And there's another really nice thing here. He has found another use for his placenta, because as well as giving him all his oxygen and nutrients, he's also been using it as a pillow. So I think you've got a very resourceful young man in there. Amelia, thank you so much for letting us meet him. Thanks very much. No problem. We've shown you the incredible organs that keep you alive and enable you to grow before you're born inside your mum. The placenta and the umbilical cord bring nutrients and oxygen and take away waste, everything a baby needs. So the next time you're looking at your belly button, remember, it used to be your mouth and your bum. And personally, I think it makes a rather good nose. <laughs> Since Amelia visited us, she's had a baby boy called Antonio John. Oh, cute! Congratulations, Amelia and Dad Damien. <laughs> Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, the hero of breathing, your diaphragm. What is going on? Lucy, meet Dr Chris. Dr Chris, meet Lucy. Zon, I know who Lucy is. We've already met. Have you? Yes. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Chris. I saw her on The Voice and it was me who asked her to come in. Was it? Yes. I thought Lucy could help us demonstrate the power of the diaphragm. Oh, right. Now, Lucy, could you give us another long note, please? Now, Lucy and other opera singers can hold a note this long because she's trained a special muscle, one which we all have, called the diaphragm. Now, your diaphragm sits here at the bottom of your rib cage. Thank you. Let's find out what the diaphragm looks like and how it works. Lucy, 
We're going to show <clears throat> you show you. Thanks, Lucy. Your diaphragm is the main muscle you use when you breathe, which is something we all do all the time. Now, to show you what a diaphragm looks like, we've got a real one from a pig. Now, this is the pig's voice box. This is the trachea, or the windpipe. These bits are the lungs, and then underneath the lungs, in a big, muscular sheet, that is the diaphragm. You breathe in and out about 20 to 30,000 times a day, and it's this the diaphragm that makes it all happen. So after your heart, it's the most important muscle in your body because it allows you to breathe. Now take a breath. Most people have no idea why the air moves into their lungs. Well, we're going to show you. Take this away, Chris. I've got a model. Now, the big bottle is your rib cage, and these things inside represent your lungs. Sand. Those aren't lungs, those are my party balloons. We're using them for a very important scientific demonstration. OK, well, I suppose if it's in the service of science. Good. And this, at the bottom, is your diaphragm. Now, we tend to think that breathing is all about the lungs, but the diaphragm is the unsung hero of breathing. It's what makes it all happen, and that's why the diaphragm is such an important muscle. Now, when you breathe in, the diaphragm pulls downwards, this lowers the pressure inside this chest cavity. This creates extra space, a vacuum, and air has no option but to rush in through your mouth and into your lungs to fill this space. And then you breathe out again. Your lungs really are a bit like these balloons. They have no muscles at all. They're just like bags, really, and they don't do anything without the diaphragm. It's pretty amazing. And to show you what your diaphragm looks like in action inside your body, here's mine. These big black areas are my lungs. Or party balloons. The pulsating bit in the middle is my heart. And down at the bottom, this is my diaphragm. Now, what you can see is my diaphragm here is contracted and now it's relaxing. And as it relaxes, it rises up and forces air out of my lungs. As you then breathe in, the diaphragm contracts again, and just like the pink balloons, the lungs fill with air. That is incredible. So, we've shown you that your diaphragm is the real hero of breathing. It's one of the most important muscles in the body, enabling you to take about 30,000 breaths a day. Chris, I really want to sing now, can I? OK, Zahn, since you love it so much, but hold on just one second. OK, Zahn. Mi piace Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today we're looking at how we power our bodies. Now this experiment is to show you what happens inside your body every time you eat. Right, now son, what I need you to do is take that tube and when I give you the instruction blow, I want you to blow into it. On blow, I go. That's right, you go on blow. <laughs> Son, why did you do that? You said blow. But now we have to set it all up again. For this experiment, we're using lycopodium powder to represent food. OK, Zond, blow torch on. Are you ready, Zond? Ready! Blow! Wow! Whoa! So what's going on? The lycopodium powder has mixed with the air breathed out by Zond, been ignited by the flame, causing a chemical reaction which releases lots of energy. Now, although there's no fire inside you, chemically this is what happens in your body when you eat. Your food is fuel, just like the lycopodium powder. It mixes with the oxygen and releases energy, which is what allows you to do all sorts of things, whether it's just breathing or running around. But how much energy do you need? And is there such a thing as too much? Well, we're going to find out. 
Your body is a bit like an engine, so it needs fuel for all the things it has to do. To show you what I mean, I've rigged up a simple engine system, and I'm going to need Zahn's body. Oh, well, no problem at all, Chris. My body is ready at the service of science. For many years, I... Actually, Zahn, I don't need that body. What? But you just said... I've got mini Zahn to help me. What? He's clamped his legs. Is that a wire in the back of his head? What is going on? Mini Zand is hooked up to an engine system which represents what your body does with the food and drink that you consume. I can do what he's doing. Stop it. When you eat and drink, your body uses it to create energy. So, with this engine, this hose full of water represents your food and drink. And when I squirt it onto the wheel, the wheel will turn, creating energy which is sent to the light bulb on Mini Zand's head, which represents his energy levels. OK, so what now? Well, we're going to see what happens when different amounts of the fuel are pumped through to Minizand. First, this is what happens to Minizand when he eats just the right amount of energy. It's a bit like if you eat a decent breakfast, lunch and dinner. So you can see we have a nice balance here. Minizand's light is on and everything is working perfectly. Your body takes the fuel and turns it into the right amount of energy you need for an average day. But what about if Minizond has had a really busy day and he forgot to eat lunch? That does happen. Good question, Zond. Well, let's find out. Now I'm putting less water on the wheel and it's not spinning, so the light bulb isn't coming on. This is not good. Exactly. That's what happens if you don't eat enough. Your poor body has no energy to do what it needs to, and as a result, you feel tired and it can mean your body won't be able to perform all its functions properly. Well, that could make him ill. I think you need to give him some more fuel right now, Chris. Yes, but I think we also need to see what happens if you eat or drink too much, like that extra chocolate biscuit I saw you eating earlier, Zant. Let's have a look. So now there's plenty of energy to power Mini Zant and his light bulb. But we're putting so much fuel in, it's getting fuller than it should be. Exactly. And that's what happens when you eat more than you need to. Your body has to find something to do with all that excess fuel. Something tells me Mini Zand is about to change. Well, the excess fuel creates unused energy, which gets turned into fat cells. Mini Zand is becoming overweight. Oh, no! Poor Mini Zand! So we've seen how when you drink and eat food, your body combines it with oxygen to create energy. And that energy fuels the things you do every day. But it's important to get the balance right between what goes in and what you use. Too little and you can become underweight, too much and you can become overweight. But unlike Mini Zand, no one becomes too thin or too fat overnight. It takes a long time to happen, so as long as you keep things balanced most of the time, your body will be happy. And of course, if you hadn't clamped Mini Zand's legs, he'd have been able to do some exercise and he'd have been fine. Uh, what are you doing? I'm taking Mini Zand for a run. But first, I'm going to buy him some decent gym gear, a chassis sports top, some good shorts, some sweatbands, a pair of decent trainers. Zand, I thought you were kidding. Ouch. Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! It can get a bit gross, but we're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at diarrhoea. Chris, you haven't seen my diarrhoea sample anywhere, have you? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, here it is. Now, let's get on with today's experiment, shall we? Have you got your sample? Well, that isn't very runny. I thought we agreed on diarrhoea. Look, I just thought it might be better to compare a normal solid poo with a runny one. Now, everyone gets diarrhoea from time to time, and one of the most common reasons is if you get a tummy bug, and the result is that your body ejects the contents of your digestive system as quickly as possible. Now, as you can see, Chris's plain solid poo looks completely different to mine. But that isn't the only difference. One of these poos weighs more. So which of them do you think weighs more? Chris's solid poo or Zahn's runny poo? As you can see, my diarrhoea poo is a lot heavier than Chris's normal poo. But why? Why is diarrhoea heavier and runnier than normal poo? Well, we're going to show you. 
Oh, so, welcome to my poo factory. Wow! Wait a minute! Are these my ballet tights? Yes. I'm just using them as part of the poo factory, and they are proving to be very, very effective fake intestines. But don't worry, don't worry, you can have them back later. First up, let's make a solid poo. Get the masher. And mash. This bowl is like the inside of your mouth chewing up the food. To help mash it up, your body adds saliva, enzymes, and it's all washed down with a drink. OK, Zan, I think that's enough. It's time to move it from the mouth to the intestines. This is like you swallowing. <laughs> nice work. Once the mashed up food hits your intestines, the muscular walls of your gut push the food along and squeeze out all the goodness. So you can see this rich liquid full of all the nutrients and the water is coming out of the guts and going into the body, which is these metal trays. And what's left is the indigestible stuff that's going to become your poo. Well, Zan, I think it's time to poo. There you go. Much, much more solid than it was at the beginning. Nice, dry, well-formed poo. We have made the perfect poo. And look how much water is in the tray. Our fake intestines managed to get almost all the water out of our poo. This water, full of nutrients, gets reabsorbed back into the body and delivered to where it's needed. So, if that's what happens to make a normal poo, what happens when you make diarrhoea? Well, it all starts in the same way. Right, Zond, put the food in the mouth and start chewing. Just as before, we have the same food and mixture. But this time, our poor intestines are dealing with a tummy bug. Time to swallow. So now something different happens. The tummy bug makes your guts draw in extra water from your body, pushing everything through your system super fast. What I've got here is a high-pressure hose, and I'm going to use this to demonstrate what happens when your guts draw in water from your body. Chris, are you ready? I am ready. Three, two, one, go! Here it comes. Oh, that's good, Zond. That's good. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that is amazing, Zond. <laughs> oh, that's enough. Zonda's turned my perfect poo factory into the world's first diarrhea machine. So, we've shown you that diarrhea is heavier and runnier than normal poo, as your intestines don't get the chance to do their job. And all the water that should have been absorbed, like the normal poo, ends up in the toilet. And you can see that in our trays. There's almost no water in our trays at all with the diarrhoea. And that's why it's also a good idea to drink plenty of water or rehydration drinks when you have diarrhoea, because they replace the nutrients and water your body has lost. Speaking of drinks, all this experimentation is making me thirsty. Chris, I'm not sure you want to be drinking that. That's my backup diarrhoea sample. Uh... Ouch. Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. <laughs> Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at a pair of organs that really clean up. Chris, what are you doing? I'm cleaning and tidying the labs, aunt. I thought we had one of those self-cleaning laboratories. Would you like some orange juice? Oh, I'd love some. Yeah, it's thirsty work, this. Here you go. Thanks, Zond. Mm. <laughs> ah! It's got juicy bits in it! Ah! Now, Chris doesn't like bits in his orange juice any more than your body doesn't like bits or waste products in your bloodstream. And what your kidneys do is help to get rid of them. Now, I can remove the bits from the orange juice using this filter. Hey! That's my tea strainer. Whatever. It gets rid of all the little bits in the orange juice, just like your kidneys get rid of all the little bits from your blood that your body doesn't want. In 24 hours, your kidneys filter and clean 200 litres of blood. And it's even more amazing when you see what a real kidney looks like. Now, this pair is from a pig, but they're very similar to yours. It might look a bit gross, but your kidneys are amazing. This tube here is the main blood vessel carrying blood into the kidneys full of waste waiting to be removed. The blood gets filtered and another tube carries the waste, we, down to this sack here, which is your bladder. Your bladder empties when you go to the loo. 
and that's the pipe that takes away the cleaned up blood and sends it back around your body. All right, let's have a closer look. Scalpel, please, Dr. Chris. Now, inside the kidney is where all this filtering takes place. There we go. This is done by a special thing called a nephron. There's about a million in each kidney, and they're so small you can't see them. So we've had to pay good money for this photo of one under a microscope. Chris, don't you just hate it when a bit of the body is so small that you can only see it with a microscope? I do, I do, I hate it. But luckily, I've got just this eventuality covered. Ooh. Come with me, Zand. Your kidneys are an amazing filtration system, and we're going to show you. To do it, I've made these. Two super-sized kidney models, one for me and one for you, Zand. These are great! Finally, a kidney model that's big enough to actually see what's going on. I love it! Yeah, I thought you'd like it. So, we're going to use our giant-sized models to show you just how your real-life kidneys clean your blood. Now, this jar represents a single nephron inside your kidneys. And just like in the real kidney, Chris has put a tube bringing blood into the nephron here, another tube bringing cleaned up blood out of the kidney, and then a third tube taking the waste away. It's amazing! OK, well, uh, thanks, son. Now, the liquid that represents your blood is here. It's got water and red glitter in it for a bit of colour. Now, we're going to pump our very attractive glittery blood through our nephrons to give us an idea of how your kidney works in real life. Are you ready, Zahn? I'm ready, Chris. Let's go. And pump. So what you can see here is the glittery blood flowing into the nephron. And it gets filtered through the nephron and then the nice clean blood travels back along the renal vein, back to the body full of all the nice stuff your body wanted to keep. Uh, Chris! And everything else, the waste, comes out here. Chris! Out of the ureter and into the bladder. Chris! My urine's darker than yours. Oh, so it is. I must have given you the dehydrated kidney. I wanted to show everyone what happens if you don't drink enough water. Oh, I see. Clever. If your wee is dark in colour, like this, it's a pretty reliable sign that your body isn't getting enough water. Being dehydrated is not good for you. Your body works best when it has enough water. Light-coloured wee, like on my nicely working kidney, is a sign that you're well hydrated. So we've seen how your kidneys are an amazing filter, cleaning up your blood and getting rid of things your body doesn't need. And the wee they produce is a pretty good sign of whether you should be drinking more water. Light yellow wee is good. Speaking of drinking more, I'd like a glass of orange juice. Now, I have some oranges here for you to squeeze for me. OK, Zand. Wait a minute, he's forgotten the oranges. Chris, you've forgotten the oranges! 